the story of what was called for a brief time the Three Musketeers of Chicago. There were actually, it was a tiny gang, and there were people who came in and came out of the gang. But, and there were three primary, well, actually four primary guys in this so-called three, uh, the three hood musketeers is what the press called them. One was Martin the Ox, Ox O-C-S, Paul uh, Labriola, and James Barcella, and usually this guy Jimmy Weinberg, who was all over the place. Weinberg was older than the other guys. He was probably some kind of business partner, aside from a criminal partner, also a business partner with Labriola. Use Hugo James Barsala, a.k.a. Jimmy Luta, is a name he loved. I looked up the name Luta. I couldn't find it in Italy, and I think it was a pun. Jimmy Lutz, Jimmy Luta. He was born in 1915. He lived at 849 North Avers Avenue, A-V-E-R-S Avenue. Barsala's record included a 1931 stolen car wrap. He did a three-year term in Joliet prison for robbery. He was released in 1936. He was sent back in 1937 on a parole violation. Returned again, parole violation in 1938. Uh, returned for <laughs> another parole violation in 1940 and was finally released from Joliet in 1944. He was suspected in the machine gun killing of Henry Dean in 1946 and of a dope dealer named Carl Caramusa in 1945. He and Nito knows uh, Labriola had been convicted of extorting black nightclub owners in 1946. Martin the Ox uh, was also suspected in both of those cases, but somehow, remarkably, he always slipped out unscathed. In 1946, Barcella, the Ox, were arrested for beating up two veterans who had just come back from Europe. World War II had just ended. Um, over a dispute over whether the nightclub orchestra should play Melancholy Baby. They beat these two guys pretty badly, too. The two guys didn't show up for court, so, of course, the case was dropped. Uh, the Ox was arrested for stealing a car in 1940, was found not guilty. On June 25, 1940, he was arrested for robbery, uh, found not guilty. January 14, 1942, he was fined 15 bucks for disorderly conducts. In April of 45, there was a murder charge planted against him, but that was dismissed. Labriola and Ox, or Oaks, were indicted for the murder of, by the way, I'm saying his last name is O-C-S, O-C-H-S, O-C-H-S, but he was called the Ox, and I think that might be easier to follow up. We'll just refer to him as the Ox. Uh, Labriola and the Ox were indicted for the murder of a guy named Maurice Barade on March 29, 1945. The indictments were later dropped because the government lost the evidence. I mean, they just misplaced it. They didn't know where it went. La Biola and the Oak, Barsala, and um, Jimmy Weinberg traveled to L.A. in 1948 in what was probably an attempt to muscle into the rackets there. Jimmy Weinberg's record, by the way, was a term in Joliet for 1934 for a burglary. Anyway, the group arrived in L.A., and the L.A.'s infamous anti-gangster squad got tipped off that they were arriving. They found them in a cafe. Uh, they said they were, quote, looking for a former pal who had disappeared after repaying 1200 of a $5,000 debt. They booked them. These, the Chicago guys got booked on suspicion of robbery. They had no mean, there was no robbery. They just booked them for the hell of it. They sent the bail at 50000 and by the end of the day, they obviously couldn't make the bill. They just threw them onto an airplane and sent them back to Chicago. When they landed at Chicago, they were arrested again on some charge. It didn't really matter. They just wanted them in jail. Barcella was murdered in his car. Well, actually, he was probably tortured outside the car, shoved in the car, and then shot. On September 4, 1948, probably for robbing mob handbooks. The body was found at 57th Street and Kilbourne Avenue, K-I-L-B-O-U-R-N Avenue. It was a quiet residential neighborhood at the time. He was shot through the head. They got him in the left temple. But he had been worked over pretty good, and there were wire marks on his neck. He'd been strangled in his chest. Uh, he'd been tortured. The Chicago police also added that Barcella was, quote, a perpetual troublemaker for the outfit. And that just added for reasons to kill him. He was a chronic troublemaker. He was a womanizer. There were incidents where these women he had 
married women he had wronged or whatever showed up at some mob clubs and were mouthing off. One had a gun. It was just crazy. And he was getting arrested just too many times. He got arrested 17 times in 15 years. He, he was a problem. Nobody wanted him around. Uh, he essentially was booted out of the mob. He said, don't come back. We don't need you around here. You're too much trouble. And he did have a handbook. He ran for them. They fired him from that. So apparently he started robbing outfit handbooks. Not a good idea. Afterwards, police rounded up the Ox, Chris the Greek, Maropolis, Eddie Korsiak, which I'm wondering is Korshak, because Korshak, the lawyer, did have a brother. Uh, Rocky Margella, uh, Libriola, of course, were all rounded up and see they, of course, knew nothing about the murder and they were just released. Paul Angelo Labriola was first arrested in 1933 for robbery, was found not guilty at trial. He was arrested a few months later for armed robbery. He was found guilty that time and sent over to Juliet for two years. Juliet is a prison, for those of you not in Chicago. Uh, or should I say was a prison? I don't know. In 1902, the Chicago uh, boss of the mafia was Antonio D'Andrea. He was a, D'Andrea was a weird guy. He was an ex-priest. Uh, in 1902, he was arrested for counterfeiting. Uh, he, he really had a weird background. He was released from prison, and he decided, well, I'll just go straight. Or at least that's what he told people. He ended up in Chicago as a translator, uh, Italian to, to English, and then later as a court translator. In 1919, he used that legitimate position as a court translator to run for the presidency of Union Ioni Siciliani, and he was elected. In 1921, D'Angelo decided he wanted to be an alderman in the 19th Ward. Uh, against this entrenched incarnate of Johnny, Johnny de Pau Powers, who I read a series of articles that said he was an Irish boss. I'm pretty sure he was an Italian who simply changed his name. They also said the 19th was heavily Irish. I think there were some Irish there, of course. You know, it was early Chicago. They were all over the place. But I think that that ward was turning, quickly turning Italian. And so that's what it was. It was for control of a, of a growing Italian neighborhood. The campaign was violent. Oh, by the way, Johnny Powers was one of the political bosses who took care of Roger Toohey and his brother Tommy, who were, you know, Tommy was crazy. Uh, he was fond of bombs, and uh, he would just blow up a safe, ruin the money, everything. Uh, but he, he mentored them, he protected them, they paid him. Uh, the campaign between DeAndre and Powers was really violent. Several bombs went off, one at a D'Andrea rally that injured five people very seriously. Two more were set off on D'Andrea's front porch, and a final one at D'Andrea's election headquarters. The election was extremely close, but in the end, Powers won by a tiny margin, 435 votes. D'Andrea lost, but he, he couldn't let it go. So on March 9, 1921, Angelo Gina, who was behind D'Andrea, shot and killed Paul Lee, uh, Labriola's father, who was also named Paul, 